Welcome to Just Theory. Our guest in this episode is Amy Adler, the Emily Kempen Professor of Law at NYU School of Law, where she teaches art law, First Amendment law, and feminist jurisprudence. In this episode, we discuss Professor Adler's paper, titled Adjudicating Authenticity. We talk about law, philosophy, and the profound relationship between authenticity and value in modern art. So, without further ado, I present you episode three on authenticity and value. We are here with Professor Amy Adler from NYU today. Uh, absolutely delighted to have you here, as we have been already talking completely before we even press record, uh, we're both incredibly excited uh, for to discuss your work with you today. Uh, the article adjudicating authenticity that you shared with us. Uh, I personally think it would have a great place in you know in the New Yorker, any mainstream magazine. It's so well written. It's so accessible, and we're so glad that we are. All of our guests are writing in a very accessible fashion. Uh, mm. I so, must second that, Alexandra. <laughs> I absolutely enjoyed reading the article and I think it's it's so accessible. And again, the idea of having it published somewhere um, in uh, non specialist journal or some experts some some elements of it in non specialist journal in, in popular press would be absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. So I think we could start with just a brief conversation about your career and why you decided to pursue a career in academia and why you have stayed. Great, I just wanna say, I'm, um, I'm so happy and honored to be on your podcast and I really admire the project. Oh, thank you very much. We're trying, I think it's part of it is trying to create this neutral space for philosophers and for women philosophers that Maybe, Amelia, you had a good phrase for this. It was normalizing the feminine presence. Yes. I think that was it. I think we, we're just trying to make sure that um, women are able to express themselves in a, themselves in, in kind of relaxed fashion with, a, with no pressure to necessarily fight for their presence, simply normalize uh, the fact that they are here and they have very interesting things to say. Mm-hmm. With that in mind, with with what we are trying to achieve with your project, I know you you with our project, I know you've been very active and actively pursuing the presence of women in, especially in legal theory. Um, looking at NYU's legal theory group in general, it's you know it, it's desperately needed across academia. I think, uh, and I'm sure that you know Amelia agrees that this again normalizing the, the female presence. And I would be very curious to hear about how you started and why you decided to pursue a career in academia. Yeah, you know, it was kind of accidental. I, I really wanted to pursue art history or English literature, but I considered that impractical. And, and I was really, you know, I was worried, how am I gonna support myself? Where am I gonna live? You know, that basic questions. And, um, then I thought about law school. I came from a family of lawyers and judges. And I thought, well, maybe I could go to law school and it would make people take me more seriously, even if I don't ever practice law, because I didn't plan to. And I was really um, reluctant to go down to the last minute. When I got into Yale Law School, I thought, okay, I can do law school without having to do too much law. I can be a little bit interdisciplinary. And so I sort of went on a whim and it turned out I loved it. I loved law school, I was stunned. You know, I thought, oh, I'm a humanities person. Um, I loved it, I found it fascinating. And everywhere I turned, I saw the gap between legal thinking and the kind of thinking that I was trained in and used to um, as someone uh, rooted in the arts, rooted in the humanities. So then I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the opportunities. And um, there I was off and running. 
I could totally relate to that because my background is actually in philosophy and I had the same trajectory uh, to try to make myself uh, or, or to, to be taken more seriously, precisely uh, via this more legal avenue and, and being heard. Um, so I can totally re relate to, to that uh, path which you, which you um, took. That's so fascinating. And perhaps you count the three of us actually, because really? my parents, yeah, I was so I was painting and I was doing art history and I was determined to go to art school. And I remember having this conversation with my parents, and we were like, you know, you like philosophy and you like writing and you like the creative arts, but maybe you can do it on the side while you pursue something, you know, more serious, right? <laughs> because we're of course worried about my future. And somehow we're all Amazing. the three of us are here talking about art and law. But <laughs> right, yeah. right. That's amazing. So perhaps this is this is a good starting point for a truly uh, philosophical conceptual analysis. However, any lawyer will begin with definitions as well. We mm. were both uh, incredibly uh, grateful for sharing your article on adjudicating authenticity, and. I was wondering if you could tell us something about uh, this work. Why did you write the article and how would you define the concept of authenticity if we can have a clear definition of the concept of authenticity? How does it play out in law and why it's important to talk about it? Yeah, so I, I, I was interested in it again um, because of the... Um, what I thought was a failure in legal discourse to understand the complexity of the problem that um, was constantly being adjudicated in various guises. And um, as authenticity disputes in, um, in law um, become increasingly important due to the, the really be having much to do with the um, raging art market and the, you know, the necessity of authenticity to um, ensure the value of works in the art market and, and also the rise of the ability to, to forge and to make copies. Um, I was struck again and again about how um, lawyers assumed a, that uh, there was a stable thing called authenticity hmm. and were not understanding the extraordinary complexity, slipperiness, um, and um, chameleon-like nature of authenticity, particularly in contemporary art, where a lot of these disputes were going on. So I chose to um, look at this problem, which of course philosophers have thought about forever, through the lens of some legal cases to see, you know, open up a new way perhaps of conceptualizing authenticity. And as for your question about definitions, it's hard, <laughs> but um, I thought about it as sort of two different axes. One, just this notion of authenticity as designating the original. Um, you know, it's the, it's the actual object, the thing, um, rather than a copy. So implicating all this problem of copying that has consumed me in my work. Um, but also this idea of authorship. That the, that the work is by the, the artist. Um, and um, that which seems so simple is also an incredibly fraught inquiry. And, and um, that's what grabbed me. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because I, it's, it's, when I was reading your article, one thing that came to mind is a certain dichotomy between the art world and the art market where mm -hmm. art is being treated as an asset and its asset value is directly related to the notion of authenticity. So when you talk about uh, Karl Perls, when you talk about how there is a certain art by fiat notion mm -hmm. that there is a committee of experts that can effectively adjudicate what is authentic and what isn't authentic. It does make me think that there is a difference and there is a conflation of two different worlds where we talk about, you know, art as an aesthetic and art as the, that we enjoy. Because there is also a difference between having a Mona Lisa. I, I was speaking to somebody about it earlier about having, you know, the fake Mona Lisa that was just sold not too long ago for, I think, <laughs> like $3 million, right? I think it was with the fake, which 
Oh, 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 I the one in France. Yes. So the yes, one in yes, France yes. when they when they bought it for like twenty dollars, I think, and, yes. and then they sold it. And it's buying it on the off chance that it's the real deal. And and just having a Mona Lisa in your room because you like looking at the Mona Lisa. There are two completely different worlds. So I wonder if if there is a certain dual nature to authenticity, the authenticity of art as an asset and the authenticity of art as a completely separate term. It's such an interesting idea, especially in this moment where the market, the, the grip of the market on the art that's seen, the art that museums show us is so tight. Um, but I think perhaps, tell me if this is responsive to what you're saying, you know, it's particularly in this era where we're all gonna be able to have perfect copies soon and, and often can, um, you know, with 3D printing, we're all gonna be able to have the Mona Lisa sooner or later. Um, the, you know, the Van Gogh Museum is um, for some years now has been selling um, such uh, perfect uh, copies of, of its holdings that they have to stamp, and it's 3D printed, have to stamp them on the back to make sure they don't get mistaken for the real thing in the market. So, so then the question is, what is it that we want when we go for the real thing? When we want, we say, no, I don't want this copy of the Mona Lisa, even though it looks exactly like the real thing. Why do we want at least in, in the case of the Mona Lisa in the museum, why do we want that? And the market, of course, wants it because <laughs> if it's not the real thing, it suddenly goes from being you know, worth, well, the Mona Lisa, I don't know if we could define it, but other works, um, millions of dollars to worth nothing. But on our own walls, um, what would we seek? What would we lose if we had this perfect replica of the Mona Lisa on our walls? What is that thing that we're seeking um, that makes that, that copy inadequate for us? And it suggests a mystery around why we value art objects. It's particularly um, puzzling nowadays when so often, unlike you know, these works we're talking about, Van Gogh, Mona Lisa, when the art object is not even touched by the hand of the artist, you know, is chosen, is designated like a Duchamp ready-made, what, why do we, um, why do we want the real thing in those cases? Mm. I, I have to intersect here because I think something very interesting was being touched upon by Alexandra here when she highlighted this, this um, overlapping of the world of art and the world of um, commerce and selling and, 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 and commercial market. And those two worlds, the commercial world and the art world, seem to be very much apart because artists then tend to be committed to non-materialistic thinking about the, uh, about the experience, about the world, and yet they try to monetize it and put value on, on their uh, work of art. And what came to my mind, and also that touches upon uh, your definition or your earlier uh, association between the concept of authenticity and authorship. I'm not sure if you came across this case recently, but um, not that long ago, a Danish artist, Jens Hanning, um, was commissioned um, an artwork by an art gallery. And instead of producing that artwork or reproduction of his, of his own art that was the commission, uh, he produced empty canvases. And he entitled his exhibition, Take the Money and Run, uh, highlighting um, in his view that this is, this is precisely my performance art and I'm trying to, um, this is the value of the art which I just produced. I highlighted the uh, divide between uh, the legal world, the fact that, that contract uh, law uh, is being exposed by my piece of art. This is my art. This is the precisely yes. the paradox inherent in this, in this performance um, art. Art. So I just I just was wondering if you have any thoughts about this intersection between the values inherent in commercial world and values inherent in, in the world of art, and also perhaps how do we define uh, authorship? Because if this artist didn't produce anything at all, and his concept or his product was purely intentional or was, was a product of, of 
convention of, of his mind, of our perception of how art is being perceived. And there is no tangible reference um, in any item at all uh, to, to any product at all. Can we say that an empty canvas is an authentic work of art? Yeah, I mean, this it's, it's such a deep and interesting question, this relationship between art and the market. And I think, you know, I would, I would probably think that the richest place to, to begin an inquiry into that relationship would be with Warhol. Mm. Because Warhol's really, um, you know, talking about um, being, you know, that quote, being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. You know, re, um, reimagining the artist, you know, the tortured genius in his garret, you know, struggling, angstridden to produce the great work. And instead, now the artist is a businessman in a factory, um, mm -hmm. not touching his work. You know, they're being rolled out on the assembly line by his workers as he sort of lounges around. And, you know, commercial techniques, um, depictions of commercial pro you know, products, the Campbell soup can, a, you know, celebrity photos. So it's that moment where this um, marriage between art and money or this inquiry into the marriage between art and money, or this um, refusal of this view of art as transcendent and art as you know, and, and commerce as lowly, that really begins. Um, and you know, another artist, love him or hate him, where we where we could see this is Jeff Koons, where you know, part of the reason, and I see this particularly in court cases, he's been in court a number of times for copyright, and courts hate him because. He's a businessman. He's not an art, or that's part of it. And it's, of course, it's part of the project, you know, the the selling, the the business of art. So I don't know that we can separate them anymore. Well, even artists must eat, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but do you remember? I mean, Damien Hirst had a really tough time in the art community, precisely mm -hmm. because when you had, you know, Bridget Riley's of the world who are producing this fantastic art he was saying openly, oh no, I'm specifically in it to produce artwork for this specific reason and I'm going to monetize on it. And it's going to be kitsch and people are gonna eat it up. So it's, it's this kind of, I don't know if it's a modern thing necessarily, I don't know if it's, it's specific to contemporary art, uh, but it's just this really strange, I don't know, it's a really strange trend. And in your paper, there's one quote that really stuck with me when you say that it seems tied to our fantasy that we can somehow be in the presence of the artist by being in the presence of his work as if his touch has imbued the object with his spirit, much like a talisman, totem or icon bears some magical trace of its origins. It's such a beautiful quote, but it also really does say something about this esoteric aspect of art that I think law is really clumsily trying to regulate. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and clumsy is, is such a good word for it. Um, you know, it goes back to when we were talking, what's the difference between the perfect copy and the actual work? It's really that, I think it's that fantasy of, of presence, that fantasy that we can be near this, um, great man, it's usually this, you know, a very masculine idea of the author, um, by somehow approaching his work. And I think it's um, connected to, you know, as you, as you mentioned, my, my interest in talismans, my interest in icons, my interest in idols, sort of deep, long-standing views about the relationship between an object and who made it or what it represents that are, you know, have, have riled Western culture and other cultures too. Um, for ages, you know, debates about um, iconoclasm, for example, this, you know, is this object more than just the object? Is it somehow got some spiritual power, spiritual connection to its maker, to what it represents? Um, this is, this is not a new question, um, but I think it's um, a place where the sort of rational boundaries of law can't begin to fathom the complexity and the depth and the passion that surrounds um, these kinds of disputes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think 
just before Amelia, I know you're burning, you have a burning question that I can see it on your face. <laughs> but before we before we move on, um, it also brings me back to, to the beginning uh, where we're thinking about definitions. And if we really go back to first principles, if you start thinking about what is art, the best way to approach this is by going to the scientists. I have a, quite a few friends who are typical scientists, don't engage with art, don't understand art. And I remember taking one of them to see the Seagram murals at the tape. Mm. And was, he, he looked around and he's like, yeah, this is great. And I was like, oh, but look at this Monet. You know, it's the juxtaposition of, of shadow and, and light. And it's so beautiful. And it put so much effort, everybody put so much effort in it. And, and he just kind of looked at me, but, but why? Why is this so special? Why? Why is it here? What is art? Like, why is this? Why is this a painting? And why if something that I painted myself that resembles that is not art, or is it art? Yes, and I think the difficulty of that question, just just quickly, um, explains in part why there is this resort to the market. Um, it used to be critics told us what was art, and then you know we got to such a pluralistic era. Um, after I guess mid-century where anything could be art that that instead a, a lot of the work being done now in terms of answering that question has been uh, pushed off to the market. I don't think anyone would people would want to admit it but if you you know who's the great artist maybe maybe unfortunately the question is often who sells for the most. I know that sounds awful and I and I know that many people would re strenuously resist that but I do think unfortunately the market, plays a greater and greater role in, in determining that basic question of what is art. I was just I was just thinking um, to just briefly go back to definitions again. And this mm. is more of a reflection rather than a question, but what came um, across very strongly when reading your article is that this concept of authenticity, um, the law always wants clarity and certainty and wants to offer something reliable and something that um, like cases must be treated alike and, and purity is, is, is the desired uh, in the legal field. However, the concept of authenticity itself, when we face particular cases, particular instances, becomes blurred and constantly escapes precise definitions. So this is a very much linguistic problem that the law is facing as much as ontological problem. How, mm. what do we actually call a work of art? Is it simply um, something that can be uh, defined in pure terms? Or when we faced with actual experience of art, the, 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 the world of artists and how art is being perceived and conceptualized by society as a, as a, as a pretty much a concept, in my view, um, art has to do uh, with uh, what society as a whole agrees on. Or, mm -hmm. or has, has, there is this kind of contract element as to what we consider to be art. And this could even be this intentional, uh, purely, uh, purely uh, a product of consciousness and agreement between, between people. Sometimes a political manifesto even uh, as with mm -hmm. the with the concept uh, with the with, with the painting uh, or uh, the empty canvas which i've mentioned before because that mm -hmm. was nothing was produced but it was kind of political manifest mm -hmm. so my my uh, my question is again goes back or, or reflection goes back if you have any thoughts on the fact that the concept of authenticity constantly escape or escapes precise definition or as this is this is something that the law with its commitment to certainty constantly tr is trying to to capture and chase but uh, this concept is is notoriously difficult to to capture if you had any thoughts on, on that and any examples perhaps that could illustrate uh, yeah. why it's so hard to to co to have a clear definition of authenticity yeah um that's fascinating um and actually, I wanted to I wanted to write down some notes as you were talking because I'm like this is going to help me as I'm working <laughs> at this problem. Yeah. Um, I you know, I think law is really stuck in an old fashioned notion that um, there is a real thing, and of course this made sense with certain artists. I mean, we can say, you know, take a Jackson Pollock or or going back farther, um, you know, take anything. Did did the artist 
touch the work? Is the artist's hand, is the, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. did he do it? <laughs> um, but that makes less and less sense in, a, in an era um, in which art has become so deeply conceptual, much like the mm -hmm. work you were just describing of the take the money and run. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. I think, you know, one, one that I write about in my paper that might be useful is the artist Dan Flavin, um, mm -hmm. where Flavin's work was in many ways dismantling this concept, these concepts of authenticity, of originality, of authorship, really raising very interesting philosophical questions um, by making works where ordinary light bulbs that you could go buy at the hardware store were like this beautiful fluorescent um, works. And, you know, of course, there's so much more complexity than I have captured by just reducing Flavin to that. But um, there was this fascinating lawsuit that I was um, following where a collector, actually a lawyer, um, had bought a Flavin, and these things are worth, you know, at least a million dollars, maybe more now. Um, and of course, uh, central to, to our story of art, central to museum collections. Um, and he had lost the certificate because the certificate is really what makes these light bulbs um, no longer light bulbs, but artworks by, um, by Dan Flavin. So the lawyer had lost the certificate, but still had the sculpture. And he went to the Flavin Foundation and he said, look, I don't have the piece of paper designating this as original and authentic and by Flavin, whatever that means, because, <laughs> um, you know, their, their mm -hmm. hardware products. And the Flavin Foundation said, and he said, give me a new certificate. And the Flavin Foundation said, we can't do that. It would be like, you know, in their view, it would be like saying you lost a painting and we want, you know, you've asked us to paint a new one. Like the, the, the certificate is central, is part of the art, that, that designation. But so, so the work become, you know, the work goes from authentic to inauthentic based on a piece of paper, not on any, uh, you know, quality of the object at all. Um, and that's just so foreign to this idea of let's, let's research this. Did Pollock paint it? Is it in his style? The connoisseur say it's in his style. Did, can we walk, trace the chain of ownership and the provenance? Can scientists, you know, check the paint and make sure it's from the right time? It has nothing to do with that. What I love about um, the Flavin story is that once I saw um, the case settled, I became curious what happened to the object. And I believe I found the work. Um, I believe, I'm guessing, that part of the settlement was allowing this collector who'd lost the certificate to donate the work to a museum because I found a work matching exactly the work that was in dispute. Um, oh, wow, that's it's so interesting. Donated to, in the year of the settlement by the collector. Mm. And I believe that's it. And, and I think what, what's so fascinating here is that authenticity comes and goes. Maybe it's authentic in a museum, but not authentic in the market. And mm. one minute it's authentic, then it's not, then it is again. And these, have, these questions have nothing to do with the object or the relationship of the object to the artist. And this is, um, is such a complex new um, approach to authenticity that has, you know, raises ontological questions, as you were saying, raises um, definitional questions. And that seems wholly foreign, I think, to lawyers who want the right answer, who think it's, it is or it isn't. Mm -hmm. What if authenticity is kind of coming and going? I think one of the most interesting cases or hard cases uh, which you discussed in your article uh, mm -hmm. is the case of photography and mm -hmm. obviously you look at the Sober and Eaglestone case but mm -hmm. it also reminded me of, of, an, of, of a, an array of issues per, um, that, that arise, um, arise uh, with ph photography in general so for mm -hmm. example I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the uh, iconic uh, Henri uh, Cartier-Bresson Cartier book, The Decisive Moment, mm -hmm. which was so rare and produced on unique paper. Um, and everyone wanted to have a copy of it. And there was just only limited edition. And most recently, there was several re-editions of The Decisive Moment. And it is interesting to see how the value of photography, original 
as it is, because of course, even the copies of those of those beautiful albums um, are almost are produced on the same unique paper and so on and so on. Uh, but they were produced later, in a later point in time. So the value of every subsequent edition becomes less and less, even though it's a photography and co and um, the same photograph, the same photograph and the same product, uh, except it is being produced at a different time and there is a different stamp on it. Mm. So that again blurs uh, blurs the concept of value. I think we attach to photography in general, um, notwithstanding the issue of authorship. Uh, can a photograph ever be considered? an authentic work of art if the only thing the artists actually do is to capture something that is external to them. Yeah. So I thought photography is, is a very poignant case uh, in general. I like that word poignant because there is something sort of, there's some pathos around this, I think, this, <laughs> this desire for the real thing in the world of uh, copying and infinite reproducibility that we now see certainly with digital photography. Yeah, um, and and you know Walter Benjamin talking about the photograph as you know as a um, medium in which there the idea of authenticity doesn't really make sense, and yet the market and again the museum world really um, prizes it and values it. This the real even I mean it's so amazing this longing for the vintage print. So, you know, this idea that I'm gonna, I'm gonna collect a print that was made at the time of the artist or by the artist or by the artist's, you know, designated printer. Um, mm. I've, I've been told by a collector that sometimes uh, subsequent prints of a work are actually more aesthetically great. <laughs> I know it's a subjective opinion, but still this, the, the real print, the real print, um, is what um, what one craves. Mm. It is poignant. Mm. This reminds me, sorry, of the, you mentioned Caddy Noland in your yeah. paper and the idea that the artist can revoke, effectively revoke authenticity. And I wonder, you know, it ties, ties in with photography because of course the authenticity of a photograph is also detachable in a way. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, there's this entire notion that we can just detach it as a concept. So what most people think that you look at a painting, you see the painting, it's a physical object, but it's this completely new layer to it that's grounded completely in convention. And it seems like exactly something that lawyers would come up with in a way. <laughs> how, wait, tell, tell me more about how a lawyer would come up with it. I, I'm because you know we like we like contracts we like like legal fictions we like yes. things that expedite other things so we like to even if there is no clarity we can come up with a definition that captures certain things so i feel like with art and and it's also as I, i'm talking as i'm thinking so it's mm -hmm. going to come out probably quite muddled but there's also this idea of about you know around copyright law and whose interest it's actually protecting because mm -hmm. if it's if we think about it as protecting the interest of the painter, well, I'm not sure that their interests need to be protected in, in the same way as we expect. But when we think about the market and the buyer, then this careful convention, they, they do deserve protection because if that careful convention between authenticity and the physical object that they're buying can be disrupted, then you need yes. some kind of an insurance policy. So is really law there to just protect whoever buys the art or, or whoever sells it. Oh yeah, I mean, and, and Katie Noland, who you began with is such a, a great example of that um, fragility, as you said, which makes me wonder why, why she's such a, you know, incredible, I mean, why people invest so much money in her work for millions of dollars. I, I don't wonder at all in terms of quality. I see the brilliance of it. But it's the fragility of whether a work is a Katie Noland or not, and and that one of the cases involving her that I write about, just to make sure uh, everyone understands who's not on this podcast and read the piece, is um, where she went to see a work of hers that was um, clearly made by her in, on the eve of its being auctioned off, and she disavowed it. She said, "It's you know that's not my work anymore. It had been damaged." But a conservator said it's you know in very good condition, 
damaged works can circulate in the market. They're still real, but they're damaged. You know, that's a different valuation. But she said, no, it's not just damaged. It is no longer a work of art by me. And what's so interesting is that the market totally respects that. So the work stops being art um, because of a declaration by the artist that isn't necessarily connected in any way to the reality of the object. And for me, this, you know, this goes back to this shift in art towards artist as someone who designates a work to be art. And this is really Duchamp. This goes back to the idea that this um, manufactured urinal is now fountain turned on its side and signed by me by a pseudonym. Suddenly this uh, ability to create art out of nothing bears with it this corollary that you can turn a work of art into nothing again. Mm. Actually, this, this, this made me think of something um, completely uh, outside of the world of art. But it seems to be the case that the law is uh, quite well equipped into um, in the way it's uh, sometimes um, dismisses items as no longer the same what they used to be. So, for example, mm -hmm. if you buy an item on eBay even, and then the item is damaged. You can declare it that the item was not as described. And then mm -hmm. eBay <laughs> immediately responds to this. Yes, it's not the same item. You 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 have fully refunded uh, for, for the item. It, it, it is not uncommon for the law to uh, designate uh, items as something that they no longer are simply because they have an attribute like they are damaged or they are no longer the same what they used to be. Therefore, they are not the same thing, um, which for, the, for an artist could be sometimes difficult, uh, although not in the case you just described. But I think it's, it's quite, quite, uh, quite common for the law to, to quickly dismiss um, an item as no longer what it used to be or what it was. But that, that was <laughs> just, I, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts of this. It was just simply something oh, that came that. to my mind. I, I love that. A sort of basic bread and butter contract issue, really. Yeah. So I yeah, yeah. no longer as described. It's, it, 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 it's, it never, it, it's not the same what it used to be. Therefore, it never existed, almost. Uh, oh, that's that's, that's the, the conclusion that law sometimes seem to be indicating. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that comparison. Thank you. Um, but another hard case which came to my mind, which we discussed um, before or maybe touched upon, um, is, is the, the, pro the problem of reproduction. Because sometimes you're mm -hmm. not simply reproducing your own work. Sometimes you reproduce reality and reproduce the art of others and combine elements of the art of others. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting uh, case in question will be, um, I'm not sure if you know, Salvador Dali was once commissioned to produce um 78 tarot cards for the uh, james bond movie live and let die that was in early 70s and he began his work on the tarot cards on the deck uh, very eagerly and wanted to produce something truly original and as you look at the deck the opening cards are his original work of art but all the subsequent uh, cards become more and more of a collage between um his own original work and famous uh, works of art. So how do you draw the line between someone's original work um, and reproduction of someone else's work? And how, how can you uh, tell that this, is, this, this work is truly authentic or is, is not truly authentic if it involves reproduction of someone else's art uh, or um, your own art even? So, so that I wondered if you had any reflection yeah. on reproduction. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I thank you. I didn't know about the Dali um, example, and I love it. I, you know, this is uh, a subject that arises not only in the context of authenticity, but in a, an area that's near and dear to my heart, which is uh, copyright law, mm -hmm. where this question of, um, it, it really arises as a defense to copyright law all the time, this, this concept of fair use. So, and, and artists are on the front lines of copyright litigation these days, precisely because copying is such an essential building block of um, creative, um, creative work in the visual arts. Um, so fair use is this, is this answer to a copyright lawsuit. An artist will say, yes, I copied, 
but I did so in a way that actually advances the purposes of copyright law itself, which is to produce um, uh, new meanings and messages. Really, it's kind of a free speech um, defense to copyright law. I, I, I needed to copy in order to say something new, which of course makes so much sense um, mm -hmm. if we think about the history of art or the, it, the history of everything, you know, all kinds of creative endeavors, fashion or, you know, design. Um, and so this is um, something that I'm, I'm really um, fascinated by. And I think courts discount the importance of copying to creativity, sort of limiting it um, in a way that fails to comprehend how important it is, particularly in a digital era where mm. the entire canon of art and every other visual image in the world, it seems, is available to us all at once in a new way that makes um, copying an incredibly important technique for artists. You know, artists have always thought about other art and created work in response to other art. Well, now, wow, we can, you know, if we can do anything. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, include myself as an artist. But you know, all of us can have access to everything, can create based on previous works. And there's a very constrained view of, of when and how copying should be appropriate in law that I think is absolutely disregarding um, the new possibilities and the new um, importance of copying, which has always been there in creativity, but has just multiplied in the digital era. I think there is a very, there's something very interesting about performance art that would tease that out. And in, our, in my original email to you, I said, you know, it immediately reminded me of what Deborah Abramovich is doing and all of her retrospectives, right? So if you have imponderability, which is this work where she and Ulai stood in a doorway of, of a museum and people were naked and people were walking through the door. And that work was reproduced several times. So it was, I think it was at the MoMA, it was at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. And what strikes me is that it's, you know, it's in a way it's reproduction, right? Because it's done, it's copying the same work of the same person by a different team of people, but under a certain supervision of, of the same person. But how much of that is copying and how much of that is creating new art? Because for performance art, I think this element of temporality means that there is always something different. And even Abramovich herself talks about it, that you know, it's all about the atmosphere, it's all about the space, and it's she's highly spiritual. And, and for her performance art, of course, you know, it's something completely different. And I think that it would be quite difficult to reconcile authenticity with reproducing one's work over and over again, because to an average spectator, they are going to this technically the same performance, right? So they're the same to them. They are the same types of objects, even though they are not the same objects. So, you know, Rhythm Zero exhibition and Tate, when there are like, I think, 72 objects that she used in her original performance, mm. to an average spectator that may almost equate to the original. But there is something lost immediately once the performance is over. So once you go through it, even if you go through it again, it's already a different thing. And I wonder if, if that should, that would indicate that there is only, you know, in performance art, it may be harder to capture what's authentic and what isn't. Because what if, let's say, somebody reproduces Marina Abramovich's performance by themselves later on, or as an homage to Abramovich, right? Would it be their work? Would it be her work? Would it count whose idea it was first? It's almost like, like we're trying to, and I, and I wonder what Law would think about that too, because there's always this idea, you know, who came up with this first? You know, it's apparent in music, who came up with this tune first? And I wonder in performance art, whether trying to reproduce a moment or, because it is effectively trying to reproduce the energy, reproduce a moment. How would we try to regulate that? If at all, does it need to be regulated in any way? Um, I love the example. And, you know, there, I was thinking again about that word poignant that I can't remember which of you raised that before, but <laughs> there's something so poignant about, um, about our, 
creating a real thing or, or um, of work that is inherently ephemeral. You know, it's gone. And yet we want, we sort of invest it with some kind of, there's a thing there, there's a, there's a real there. Um, and, and I just, um, I do find it fascinating. And then where would the, um, where would the object be when it's already lost? I'm, I'm not sure I'm, that this leap that I'm gonna make um, is gonna be an obvious one, but I'm, it makes me think about um, in the early 1900s, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre um, and people lined up um, for hours to go gaze at the spot where it had hung. And I just, I just love that. It's something about um, the absence of the work, the loss is bound up in our reverence. You know, but, but the legal questions that one would ask about, about Abramovich or other works, you know, would, would go to, I think, basic questions about copyrightability. First of all, can you copyright ephemeral works? And of course we can copyright dance. And so that, that idea would um, extend. But um, again, the sort of philosophical questions it raises about where is the thing, what's real? Can we capture ephemerality are to me very, or at what point does real, real represent loss <laughs> in a way, you know, th these are questions that I find um, captivating. That's absolutely fascinating. And again, it made me think of yet another example mm. that I happen to, to, to be actual witness of. Mm. I think it was back in 2004 when library in Weimar, Anna Amalia Bibliothek was um, dissolved uh, in fire. Oh. So all the works of Goethe, Wagner, original scripts, all this was burned. And I remember as if it was yesterday that I was standing with the crowd looking at this library burning um, and pieces of original mm. art, artwork by Goethe, Wagner and so on, just floating in the air and people capturing wow. pieces uh, of, that, of those original uh, works and bringing them back um, to restore whatever was left because the roof of the library was wooden. It just, everything just burned. So there was not very many works left. Some, some actually, some works were even discovered subsequently uh, that they, the library didn't even know they had it based on those pieces wow. that people brought back. Um, but there was there was a certain element of um, of nostalgia and uh, incredible sadness, which I suppose was similar to staring at an empty spot of the Mona Lisa, which mm -hmm. was present in that in that event, um, which again was <laughs> I don't want to use the word poignant <laughs> again, <laughs> but 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 also this this how the art is actually. Uh, how, how it continues to live in people's minds, even if it's no longer present. Yes. And, uh, and how, how, how does the law respond to such situations <laughs> as well? That, that's, that's another uh, interesting question um, that, that perhaps is to be asked. Uh, so what, how law regulates or how law responds to human emotion effectively? Yeah. Because when you look at, but then another layer of that, I think would be looking at art when you go to any graduate show, so for a few years in a row, I was going to the Royal College of Art uh, to look mm -hmm. at the graduate show. Mm -hmm. And you have all sorts of things there. You have people from all over the world presenting their work. And it's there is always this element of, there are always art critics, you know, critics and buyers coming in trying to snap the next talent, right? The next, mm -hmm. the next Pollock or, or whoever. Um, and there is always this element where you walk through it that, there's some art that makes you respond in a certain way, but there's also a lot of stuff that just, you just, it just doesn't resonate with you, but it feels like it's, there are elements of it that are so subjective, mm -hmm. but there are some works that really resonate with everyone. And it's really strange to think of something so ephemeral and something so delicate being treated with law as this kind of hammer <laughs> that sees things in binary terms. 
Absolutely. You know, listening to both of you talk, I'm struck by the um, the binary that we assume between um, the real and the fake or the object that was lost. Um, I was thinking, th again, thinking about that library burning, I was thinking about um, how cultural our notions of authenticity really are and the contrast between um, the Shinto idea in Japan of authenticity. And there's this great um, example that I love of um, the temple at Ise. And the idea there is that to, to have an authentic temple, this age old temple, I can't, I can't remember the dates, um, a Shinto temple, um, that the best way to preserve that temple, the best way to have an, the authentic temple is not to, you know, keep um, zhushing it up and, you know, <laughs> fixing it up and, and preserving the actual thing, but rather to richly reconstruct it. I think it's every 40 years on a, on a plot next to the next to the temple is another plot where the new one is being built at all times. So authenticity is this thing, not about, not something you lose as an object burns, but rather authenticity is something you, you continually renew. Hmm. Um, and I love, I love that idea just because it's so foreign. Hmm. To, it's like Warsaw to, old to town, you know? So in Poland, the, in, Warsaw was de destroyed in a war. I think 95% mm -hmm. of the buildings were just mountains and mountains of nothing and the people rebuilt it and now most tourists who come over they are not told that this hasn't actually none of this is old all of this is new all of this is like circa 1950s yeah the old town is new <laughs> old town is new town there are many older older buildings in warsaw you know but there is still this sentiment that remains that people don't actually want to sit on you know, piles of brick and mortar that used to be something, but they do want to enjoy or have a certain continuity. And in the example that you just gave, I think in Japan and Japanese culture in, in general, there is this idea of continuity that maybe overtakes some kind of a sentiment that maybe is so prevalent in Western culture in a way that we like to think that the hands there were certain hands that touched the same building a thousand years ago and now we're touching it yeah and it's still the same thing yeah i mean it's really it's that you know it, it goes back to plutarch and the the ship of theseus but, you know this idea that um as the ship rots if the if the planks are are continually replaced at what point is this um restored boat uh, still the mm. ship of Theseus when the new planks have been brought in and, and it's, you know, Warsaw, as you're describing it, that's the ship of Theseus. Is it still real? Mm. I don't know. It's real. At least the bricks are the same. Well, mostly, although mm -hmm. it's, it's such a weird, I don't know, I, I always find, I, I always find it very strange as a concept that you rebuilt, yeah, sure, you rebuilt Warsaw, but it's not like the same building was built from the same bricks. It's like they just had a pile of bricks that they reused and mm -hmm. then they made everything, covered everything with paint and made everything look pretty. So you are technically still, it's still technically old town, mm -hmm. but it's not <laughs> yeah <laughs> just I, I'm, I'm incredibly sorry to depart from the agronauts ship and and all the uh, all the um fascinating ideas i'm mindful of time uh alexandra would you like to ask the questions that you said um at the like beginning just just because because i don't want to <laughs> <laughs> keep amy <laughs> forever if forever you, yeah. uh, so the five questions that we use for our knowledge bank uh, mm -hmm. are quite short uh, and we I think this the entire idea of asking our guests the same five questions came out of just knowing that there are many aspiring scholars or many female aspiring scholars in the area of you know philosophy and law legal theory uh, who are trying to decide what to do with their life and and they're seeing that this is a very aggressive in many cases uh, sometimes not a very pleasant environment to be in and they may think 
you know, maybe I should choose another career path. And we're trying to say, no, we definitely need you to, to roll with us and we're going to change <laughs> things from the inside. Um, so the first question is, who or what was your biggest inspiration in your career? Um, it sounds sappy, but it's my father. My father was a lawyer who was an artist on the side and gave so much of his time. He'd come home from work and, and go off to a live um, figure study class to, to work from a live model. We had a studio in our basement, um, an art studio. He was making things all the time and looking at things all the time, every free moment he had. And uh, there was a passion there um, that I really admired as well as, you know, I'm thinking about what you guys said in the beginning about normalizing the, the um, women in, in academia. For me, he normalized this connection between art and law um, in a way that it, certainly when I went to law school, um, it was not normal at all to be thinking about those things in tandem. It's still not fully normal. I can tell you that. No. It's, it's, I've, no. been told, I've been told so many times in my life that, you can either do one or the other and there are yes. so many people at every single step that when you say art and law it's either managing transactions for purchasing art as an asset mm -hmm. or pretending that you're interested in art so you have conversations you know you can have a conversation at the cocktail party yeah i think that's right it's it's a growing field now but for a long time it was really dismissed and i remember when i was going on the market as a as an academic, I, a scholar at a uh, very important institution said to me, so wait, you spend a lot of your time doing this art thing? Is there something else? <laughs> as if, you know, I was sort of busy thinking about, I don't know what could be more trivial or lowly to him or unimportant or, or such a sliver of um, what mattered in the world. Oh, it's dismissed. That's terrible, but <laughs> it's changing. It's changing. So that's the yeah. most important thing. So what do you wish you could tell your graduate student self? Yeah, so I actually, I wish that I could have my graduate student self tell me um, to have more fun. I think that the, um, in some ways, being in the academy has cramped me a little bit. Um, has, has me a little bit more worried about um, fitting in to a conversation where at times I am, you know, interested in things that don't preoccupy so many of my colleagues. And when I was in, in law school, I was free. I was free. I was writing in so many ways just for myself. So I, wanted, I want her to come tell me <laughs> that I can still do that. I mean, yeah, do you share the sentiment? I do. <laughs> do you really? Yeah. Really? Oh, that's so interesting. I, I didn't know other people felt that way. Yeah, I suppose so. It's it's just um, I think uh, I think we are sometimes uh, too serious when we when we young and we would rather <laughs> be told um, to to um, not not to be. So to say, say so. Uh, yeah, I was more playful when I was mm -hmm. young, and I, I, I want it back. I'm still <laughs> playful, probably too much for my own good, mm -hmm. but I was much more so. <laughs> well, maybe our our mission, Amelia, could change to injecting fun into academia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you could only read one book for the rest of your life, what would it be? Not to sound like a religious zealot, but I'm taking the Bible. Um, you know, if it's the um, basis of Western culture, there must be enough there to last a, life a lifetime, at least I hope. I thought about Shakespeare. I think the Bible's, let's just get back to it. Let's go to the beginning. I, I think my law and literature classes scarred me for life when I was in my undergrad, uh, because most <laughs> people wanted to write about Shakespeare, and I was I like insistent on writing about modern contemporary theater. Uh, oh. So 
Shakespeare wouldn't be my first choice, but I respect your answer with the Bible. I think it's uh, full of, definitely full of stories. And even if you're not religious, it could be quite interesting. It could be quite an interesting read for different times of the day. That's for sure. Um, And it's taught as literature. Often it's taught as literature, so. Yeah, absolutely. And something that survived for that long, I think deserves some recognition in in itself when you think about it. (laughs) The question is terrifying. One thing for the rest of your life. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it depends how long your life will be, I suppose. I always say (laughs) that. My mom had the sentiment that she said, oh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to wake up the next day. I'm like, "Mm." Uh, nor do I. So if you had not been an academic, what alternative career would you have chosen? I suppose I would have been a lawyer and and probably miserable. (laughs) Although I will say increasingly that I find when I do consult on legal cases in my areas of expertise, I'm now fascinated by the practice of law. Mm. And the sort of intellectual puzzles that are posed by trying to translate what I think about in a, in a theoretical realm onto, into, you know, a litigation. I but suppose, I, I suppose it's quite different when you're actually being consulted on a difficult point of law, as, po- as opposed to when you're sitting on cases that are all alike and you're just processing papers and papers uh, of, of identical data. So that's the advantage of being a, a consultant that you actually being given those uh, tasty little bits where um, the law becomes truly interesting and uh, intellectually appealing or maybe yeah. I'm wrong because again as a philosopher I never practiced law so perhaps even processing thousands of data is as fascinating and interesting maybe Alexandra knows more about it <laughs> it isn't it really isn't I think most of litigation I, I am quite jealous uh, of of the consultancy uh, mm-hmm. aspect of it, because I think that Amelia is, it's, I would imagine Amelia is quite right in that, or her intuition is quite right that you do get consulted or you must be getting consulted on, on the most complicated or the most interesting cases, uh, rather than being stuck with associates need discovery. And I, and I only do it, I do it rarely. I only do it when I can say without um, hesitating that the position of the client is one that adheres, you know, aligns perfectly with where I stand as an academic. Um, And sometimes that happens, although not that often. And two, that it will um, enrich my understanding of an academic area I'm interested in. And that's been an incredibly valuable thing for me to kind of learn from getting my hands dirty with, you know, the nitty gritty of a real world example. Amazing. And the final question, is finish this sentence. One thing no one talks about in academia is how much we get paid or not. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. And there was an, uh, the situation is not that much better. Although no, it is better in the UK because you do have uh, certain gradings that are very difficult to change. I see. So it is public knowledge. Some universities, some public universities do have that information, but Private universities do not. People don't know how much um, other faculty members make. It's it's um, and for obvious reasons, I suppose it's not discussed. But mm-hmm. it does create interesting collective action problems. Is it a little bit like with Hollywood, where all the actresses started finding out how much their partner actors started earning, and everybody just kind of went, oh. Yep. I'm, I have no doubt that it's that secrecy um, probably works to the disadvantage of, of women in academia, but I don't have numbers to prove it because I don't know. Nobody knows except deans, I suppose. And on that very dark note. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's absolutely, it's absolutely fine. Uh, Amelia, would you like to wrap up? Thank you so much, Amy. It's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you and even more fascinating to read the paper. I have to say that it is incredibly, it was incredibly thought provoking for for myself. And and I really do hope that we will find it um, printed soon. Um, So so thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for for the contribution. And I hope we find at least 
this conversation at least a little bit useful for your purposes. Uh, we tried to think about how to maybe approach the subject from slightly different angles or at least uh, help you, oh, well, contribute to your thought process in some respect uh, in return for your precious time. Oh my God, I think I've got more than I gave. It's um, incredibly interesting and fruitful for me to hear what you guys think and, and to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Emily, thank you. Hi, it's Alexander here. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like our project, have any questions, or would like to recommend a guest or a topic, drop us a line on just.theory.project at gmail.com. This season was made possible with the generous funding of Newcastle University. If you like, you can buy us a coffee. Your support will enable us to continue our work. Just Theory, changing the face of legal theory. <laughs>